Hi there, this is Elise Benin, your marketing mentor. And this is the podcast for you if and only if you are ready to leave the feast or famine syndrome behind, and I mean for good. Does your business model allow you to make the living you need to live the life you want? And do you even know what your business model is? Did you choose it consciously or simply fall into it? In this super interesting conversation with fellow business coach for creatives, Jessica Abel, we identified the differences and similarities between the different types of creative professionals we each serve. Her coaching focus is on foundations, first principles, and structure for a business, while mine is on mindset, marketing, and money. And all of that really complements each other. So listen and learn. Hello, Jessica. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Of course. Please introduce yourself. Okay. I am Jessica Abel. I am a cartoonist and author turned creative coach. We're coach for creative business owners and for creatives of all kinds. I founded The Autonomous Creative, which is my coaching company about eight years ago now. Mm -hmm. And I work with mid-career creatives who are probably really awesome at what they do professionally, but maybe not so awesome at the business side and need to figure out how to start bringing in money commensurate with the excellence of what they do. Interesting. And, you know, part of what I've learned as I've been doing my preparation for this conversation is that, I mean, in a way, what you just said could be said about me and what I do, and I'll tell you how I position myself. But as I was doing my research, I realized we both call ourselves business coaches for creatives, but it seems like we do two very different things. And one of the things I find kind of fascinating about that is just that, and I think this goes for everyone who does a thing that someone else also does, There's so many things about it that each of us do in a unique way. And yet someone coming to us for help wouldn't know that unless we make it clear, unless we know ourselves what those things are and kind of put it out there in our marketing. So I just wanted to kind of start with that idea and see what your thoughts are about it. I mean, I totally agree. There are many people who work I mean, not as many as you would think, but there are many people who work in the area of business coaching for creative people, but um, that can mean all kinds of different things. And I know that my particular orientation is towards foundations and structure. It's really about business models, offer development, stuff that I feel like I missed out on as Mm. a creative. I didn't, nobody talk to me about these things. I didn't know they even existed or that there was something you could do, you know, intentionally about it, about how your business is set up. Um, as an author, I had no idea. <laughs> and that showed in, you know, how that all played out for me. And so I want to correct that for other people. But then, you know, I know a lot about marketing. I know a lot about copywriting. I know about other stuff, but I really only help people with that sort of alongside or as a support for this core foundational work of setting up a business that is designed to meet your needs, that is designed to pay your bills. That's where I sit. And so as a result, I think I call myself a coach, but I think I probably fall more in the strategist slash consultant space. Mm -hmm. I do a lot more kind of talking and leading people through stuff that needs to happen than kind of opening space and holding space for people and saying, what do you think? And how's this working for, you know, Mm. it's, um, everybody has to, of course, design their own business and make it something that works for them. So it's, it is very individual and that that's the coaching part, but there's also a lot of fundamentals that most people don't learn. And that's what I'm, 
most interested in in conveying to people and getting them to incorporate into their business structure. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting. I mean, it's true. And I think part of the reason I just fell into and started my business, it's been actually 35 years that I've been doing this. And it was because I looked around and saw a lot of creative people who just didn't know how to make a business out of it and almost felt like... I think you've talked about it as that creative and business are sworn enemies, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, that's what people perceive. Yeah. They, I think that's what we're taught. That's what we're told that not only sworn enemies, but there's a something kind of soiled and dirty about mm-hmm. caring about business for creative people, but also we're told we're not any good at it, that we're not going to be good at it, that there's no point in trying because there is no way to do this that will work. And uh, so a lot of that sworn enemies thing is really more defensiveness, I think, than anything else. Certainly people on the business side are curious about artists, but generally think of artists as being these, I, I talk about the idea of the purple unicorn, like they're this special, beautiful creature who, you know, spouts magic, but isn't really reliable and isn't really fully functioning as far as in the brain department, (laughs) you know, and it's really insulting, frankly, you know, I mean, creative people are the most, you know, scrappy, inventive, uh, committed people I've ever met. And so of course we can do business. Of course we can master these principles. Yeah. It's scary. Sure. But it is 100% doable. So let's talk about some of those principles and foundations and structures, because I I like the way you approach it and some of the language that you use and even the idea of like, what's your business model? And did you know there's more than one business model? So <laughs> mm-hmm. just talk to me a little bit about the foundations and the business models that you teach. Well, I think the primary area I work in with clients is in developing a high-end service-based business. There's a variety of business models within that umbrella. You know, some people I work with are designers and they have clients and, you know, do projects. It's very sort of understandable from the outside, right? But I also work with people who are artisans, like portrait painters, um, silversmiths. One person I work with builds custom bass guitars, you know, so that like very high end handmade products that are very customized. Um, And then other people have other kinds of service businesses like coaches, writing coaches, uh, various kinds of creative coaching. I have, I'm working with somebody who's a podcast coach or mentor, leader, whatever. You know, that there's lots of different ways of thinking about it. But people who do service for clients. And the reason I do that and the business model, the business models I'm, I'm teaching, they're intended to be ones that if the person desires can be designed to work in a few days a week or only mornings or something like that. So they don't take up all of your time and you still have time for your personal creative work that may be your true mission in life, you know, is showing in a gallery, writing, whatever. That's, you want to make sure that you are protecting time for that work. But when you take the economic pressure off of that work to bring in, to pay the bills, it really frees you up. It doesn't mean you can't make money from it, but if it doesn't have to make money for you, it frees you up to do whatever you want creatively um, and often makes it much easier just to do the work because you're not feeling like, well, is this going to be a smart move, you know, uh, strategically speaking? You don't have to think about that. You just do the work that you want to be doing because you know you're paying for it in this other way. You're leveraging a skill set that you have through, you know, making your own work to help other people with something. And when you're working with clients, then, you know, you are solving something for them. It could be a, you know, very pressing problem. It could be a great aspiration. It doesn't have to be, you know, quote unquote painful. Um, And for artists, it often isn't, right? Uh, It's something that's more aspirational. But you're solving something, which means that the person who's paying you the money has they can see the value in what you're doing for them. They understand what's in it for them very clearly, which makes the sales process much uh, easier. And it makes it, it's just much easier to, to pay your bills that way. And so that's what I generally speaking teach at when I'm doing business coaching, business strategy work. 
of course, there are many other business models in, you know, cohorts of people who I work with on more on the productivity side or other kinds of things, people who are authors, people who are trying to make a living selling, you know, art on Instagram or, you know, selling prints or doing gallery shows or these kinds of things. And there's plenty to be done to improve all of those business models as well, but they are more challenging. And so my personal interest is in trying to get people from the point of not being able to pay their bills to being able to pay their bills comfortably. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, And so I want to do that in the most efficient way possible. And that's why I lean on these particular business models. But, you know, I do definitely delve into others as well. And so it sounds like you're talking about teaching people how to build a business that will earn them, you know, a living so that they can do this other thing that is the, maybe what they call their creative work. And so it sounds like people are like, is one a side business and the other is a hobby or like, which is which is the question in my mind. I mean, I think it differs for each person and some people, for some people, there isn't a second thing. They just want to have time for their life. You know, they just want to, Mm. you know, not be overwhelmed all the time and, and not have to be scrambling all the time. And that's Mm -hmm. totally fine too. But I do have a number of clients for whom their studio practice or their writing practice is the primary thing they want to be doing with their lives. And often they have so far been trying to support that practice via teaching, you know, um, either tenured faculty or adjunct faculty doing, you know, one-off jobs here and there. And what that ends up, what ends up happening is they're just so busy with that stuff and so burned out by all that stuff. They don't have room or time for the kind of attention they want to put into their studio practice. But that is their primary identity is as an artist or writer or whatever it is, right? That's what they want to be doing. And yet they're not making the living at that thing. It's just really difficult. You know, they may be bringing in some money, but it's just incredibly difficult and very rare yeah. for people to bring in a living wage or more like a comfortable living with purely self-directed creative work. It's hard. So they're looking for a way to support that. And that work also then feeds into their business as a form of social proof, essentially, like they're doing the thing. They really are the real thing. <laughs> You know, so I don't think it's a matter of side business versus whatever. I mean, they have a business and they are, you know, creative, you know, artists or writers, or I'm, I'm, tr- I'm struggling to say, cause there's such a range of people I work right. with, but you know, they're cre- yeah. like, that's their primary mm-hmm. role in society is that, but they also have a business that then supports that. And I do see, because I work mostly with what I would call commercial creative professionals who are marketing, copywriting, design, photography, videography, marketing, coaching, all of those services. They're really clear on what they're marketing and they just want better clients with bigger budgets. Basically, that's my focus is how to help get that. So I don't see the challenge in the people who find me, but one thing I do see that I hear in what you're talking about is sometimes there is this frustration because they're a creative and they want to be creative in the work they do for their clients. And yet the clients aren't always interested in the creativity or they have other agendas or other priorities. And there's a frustration that they can't have the creative freedom that they would like to in the work that they are making their living at. I mean, I think that's an ongoing problem and is a, is a problem of I don't know that it can be solved, you know, across the board. I think in general, when you go into a, an engagement with a client with very clear uh, boundaries around what it is that you do and you don't do, and when clients are coming to you specifically for the differentiated thing that you do, you know, that you are known for, uh, that can really help with being able to do the kind of work that you want to be doing. I also think it helps actually to have much higher prices <laughs> because clients will pay you better, will will treat you better when they pay you better. They mm. will treat you as an equal um, when they're paying you a lot and believe that you know what you're doing and follow your guidance more often when they are giving you a lot of money. 
ironically. I mean, it seems weird, but I think that's definitely true. And I think a lot of people who are in the market, uh, you know, the people that you work with, many of them do want to do their own work. They want to do something, you know, like a lot of copywriters want to write a novel. You know, a lot of Mm -hmm. people who are doing video work for clients, they also want to make their own films. I think there are ways to think about, like, if they are, if they do find bigger clients, um, there may be periods when they are only able to focus on client work because it's just such a big job and they need to really, you know, double down on that. But that may mean that they can then take breaks and do their own work. And so this is something that, you know, overall, like the work I've been describing here is the business coaching work that I've been doing for the last few years. But I earlier started working with people around uh, productivity, creative productivity. And um, that was the first thing that sort of, that was the first piece of my business. and. Very frequently people come into that program, uh, which is called the Creative Focus Workshop, because they do have some kind of full-time whatever, but they really have something else that they're driven to make and they want to figure out how to balance these things. And they just think, I've got to be able to do it all at the same time. And Mm. what's interesting and what I've come to through business coaching is actually you don't, you can't solve, often can't solve the, I need time for my personal work question without solving the business question. Because if you aren't making really good money and having great clients, you can't pay for enough free time for yourself. Right. You know, so you end up working too much, taking on too many things, saying yes to too many things, you know, having the crappy clients who, you know, eat up all of your time and all of your attention and you, and you get really burned out. And so even through working with my clients in the Creative Focus Workshop, I found very often it would come back to work or family conversations that needed to be had around what are the negotiations that you need, renegotiations you need of your boundaries, of your pricing structure, if we're talking business, with your boss, with your partner, you know, all those kinds of things. You know, we are single beings. We like to pretend there's something like work-life balance, which means they're like on separate ends of the seesaw, but that's not true, right? It's Mm -hmm. all one life. It's all one thing. And all of those domains need to coexist. And that's, I think, where most productivity stuff falls apart because it treats it like they're separate domains and you need to deal with them separately. But if you deal with them separately, you will never solve it because you're just going to have like a full to-do list for each thing (laughs) and they're not going to fit in your life. So two thoughts there. One is about Oliver Berkman and the other is about pricing and charging high prices. So I'll come back to that second one. Oliver Berkman, are you familiar with 4,000 Weeks? I'm actually quoted in 4,000 Weeks. Are you awesome? (laughs) Because I mean, his main point, as you know, then is you're just not going to do everything. So yeah, accept that. Yeah. Right. As a fact, we are finite. Our time is finite. So decide. I love it when he says, decide who you're going to disappoint. Yeah. It's very British of him. (laughs) I love his framing around this idea of mortality that like, this is, this is the time you have, um, as you know, my productivity work. And it's, I, I'm sort of, I'm not saying, I'm not even saying the air quotes, but basically whenever I say the word productivity, I'm thinking about air quotes because it's not about productivity. It's about priorities and choices, dilemma, making hard choices, facing the hard choices that are in front of you instead of not facing them and ending up with just trying to take on everything and mm-hmm. and then failing it at all because you are completely overcommitted. His writing, what he's been doing for the last, you know, any number of years and what I've been doing are in parallel, like they're very mm-hmm. consistent with each other. Mm-hmm. And we've become friends as a result of that. You know, he nice. he quoted me a few times in his column and he he quoted me in his book. And I just I I love his work. I think he's really brilliant at helping us crystallize why this is the case. Like I've been talking about the idea of dilemma and facing dilemmas for, you know, seven or eight years basically. And then he talks about mortality and I'm like, yes, that that's yes. why. Exactly. <laughs> now we now we really have it, you know, on point yeah. there. Yeah. And so this is kind of connected to the other point, which is how does one, how do you help creative people charge more when there seems to be a lot of emotional baggage or I'm not worth it or no one's going to pay it. Like there's just so much that 
they put, we put in the way mm-hmm. of charging more. How do you help people through that? I mean, there are so many different moments that you have to help people in different ways mm-hmm. to get over that. So I don't know that there's a single answer. Mm-hmm. Um, the primary thing I do in my methodology that helps with that at the outset is I start people very early with doing market research, interviews, talking to people. And the people I'm working with are all great at something already. You know, I'm not talking to people who are straight out of college. I'm not working with people who are straight out of college and they're trying to figure out what their career is going to look like. These are people who have a career of some kind that's really interesting, but it just isn't doing what they need it to do for their lives in various ways. And so when they go out and they talk to people about what is what do they need in, in the area in which this person is expert, in that open-ended kind of way, they start hearing how valuable what they do is. And almost always come away from that process feeling reassured that the pricing that they've come up with makes sense. You know, that it actually does, that they are doing something that has real value for the people that they want to serve. Um, so that's the first layer. Mm-hmm. You know, the the first thing I do with people before we even get there is we we set up the the structure of the business model and the offer in terms of client load and pricing first. So they come in with some idea of what they want to do. And this is if we're not doing full offer development. This is, you know, like from from scratch, I don't know what to do. That's that's a whole mm-hmm. other deal. But like they come in with a business idea, right? And we go through, well, what what could that look like? How many people could you potentially take on? Would you want to take on? Okay, what does that mean in terms of your pricing? If you're going to hit this number that's actually going to be supporting your life. You start there and then you go into these interviews and you, cause most people are then look at that number and their brain blows up mm-hmm. and then they have, they go into these interviews and then they start understanding how, what they do fits into people's lives. And that helps a lot, but then there are many other steps and stages where they have to grapple with saying the number out loud, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, um, you know, we do a lot of training around, uh, Messaging, you know, creating really powerful messaging that connects, uh, you know, value propositions, um, sales conversations, like how do you lead a sales conversation in such a way that it's based on consent and, you know, having a partnership with the person you're talking to as opposed to, you know, attacking them with this, uh, with your ideas. Mm-hmm. And, you know, all of that helps. It all sort of builds up and helps. It's n- I don't, I'm not sure it's ever a journey that's totally over. Um, but I also like to talk to people about the fact that much of that feeling of like, I am not worthy doesn't come from them. It comes from society around us, which Mm. is, you know, it's this mythology around art that art should be done for love and not for money. If it's done for money, then it's not any good anymore. But if you're not paid, then you're not any good. So what do you do? Right. Right. Um, and people get stuck in the middle. So. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to pretend it's easy, but it is yeah. an absolutely necessary thing. And and I actually, going back to that very first exercise that I do with people, um, pricing your work for a profit, which is a workshop that I do sometimes. Yes, you come up with a scary number, but you also see why that number is real. Mm-hmm. You see why you're asking for that number because you know what you put into your goal uh, amount. You're not pulling it out of the air. You're not just saying like, I don't know, I think $2,000 sounds great. You know, you need to charge $2,000 for whatever it is, because if you don't, you will not be able to pay your bills. Yeah. So you tie it to reality, Mm -hmm. basically. The other thing I hear in what you're saying is I talk a lot about listening to the market. And it sounds like these interviews are all part of an effort to listen to the market rather than listen to the crap in your head number one, Mm -hmm. which someone else put there in the first place. All right. I'm going to ask you one more question and then we'll look for a baby step that people can uh, take on any of these things we've been talking about. Because it seems like I am biased. You probably are too about self-employment, right? It's the best thing out there. I would never go back. I don't know about you, but I would never go back. But it's not for everyone. No. Right? And I'm curious... Like, who do you think it's for or not for? That's an interesting question. I mean, 
I work with undergrads also. I teach um, and I have students coming through every year who, you know, we're talking about their path and where are they going to go professionally? What do they want to do? And I talk about what it's like to run a business and give them kind of the rundown of the things that you need to have in place in order to have a successful business. And many of them are like, oh no, <laughs> that doesn't sound good at all. Right. And, and I say, well, you know, employment is an option and I don't, you know, but you're not going to get employed as an illustrator. There, there just basically aren't jobs. Essentially, there are not jobs as an illustrator and I'm teaching illustration. So you're going to do something else. So think about what that might be and try to make it something that's paid well, you know? And I definitely think there's a place for, again, if your primary thing you want to be doing in the world is contemporary art or writing, really any kind of writing pretty much other than copywriting, if it's you know, creating, you know, certain kinds of objects that are, you know, if it's knitting, if it's quilting, like all these kinds of things. I work with people who want to do that stuff all the time. They do amazing stuff. It's so beautiful. It's so awesome. But trying to force that to pay for your life is painful and often doomed to failure. Like it's not, it could pay you something, but it's not going to pay you enough. And it's just like ongoing struggle. So I don't want to drop anybody who's listening to this. If you are in that category, not trying to depress you. I think what's important is that you grapple with that reality and you say, okay, is there a a true path to like a reasonable path to making a living with this thing as an independent worker? If that's what you want to be doing and you don't want to be working with clients and you don't want to try to figure out marketing and building an audience and you don't want to try to, you know, deal with like all of the pieces that go into self-employment, get a job. But get a job that pays you well for not all of your time. I know that's a high bar, but it's like use the skill set that you have to find something that you can do that pays you well and, and allows you to go home and not think about it at a certain hour of the day that is an early enough hour or a few enough hours that you can do the thing that you really want to be doing and not worry about the money for it. Right. And you talk a lot about the marketing gurus out there who are proclaiming that all you have to do is this and you can make millions of dollars, six figures, seven figures, whatever it is. And I really love the fact that you are, you know, talking about the reality of how hard it is and how much effort it goes into it and how all these things that, you know, for the most part, you're not going to want to do, but they have to be done. So someone's got to do it. Yeah. And I mean, I personally, I like running a business. I like all the pieces of it. I mean, I can get frustrated and I can be annoyed that I have to write yet more emails or something like that. But basically at a basic level, I like it. And so I'm well suited for this. But I always talk to, again, my undergrad students, what I'm trying to explain what this is like, it's like when you work a job, so you have a retail job, right? When you're a retail person, your job is to keep the store clean and to be nice to customers and to check them out, you know, close the store, you know, you have very specific things that you need to do. You punch out, you're done. It's over. It's somebody else's job to make sure that the um, sales for your location are at the right level and then make adjustments at the managerial level if they're not to whatever you're doing to sell. It's somebody else's job to bring people into the store. It's somebody else's job to do the books. for You know, those jobs are all divided up among other people. And you don't have to think about any of those things. But as soon as you decide you're going to have your own business, you have to do all of those things. You have to get the attention. You have to convert the attention to sales. You have to then deliver on the offer. Then you have to take all that money that you made and keep your books and get your taxes done. You know, And you have to keep it going constantly. You can't stop because it's just you. <laughs> and all of those things can be super overwhelming if you are not committed to the work that you're doing, you know, it's not really what you want to do. And that's often the case I find with creative people that they're doing stuff that isn't really what they want to do because it's bringing in a little bit of money or it's whatever. And they just haven't ever kind of stepped back and said, okay, should I just go get a job? Should I just go do something that would like, you know, and if they do, it's like failure. You know, if they do go get a job, then it's like, I failed at being an artist, which is absolutely not true. Absolutely Mm. not true that being a creative person and being like that being your main identity and what you really about in the world has nothing to do with making money. Right. It has nothing to do with making money. It has nothing to do with how much money you make. You know, you get to define your own 
definition of success. And if your definition of success is winning a Guggenheim and living off your earnings and whatever, you don't have control over that. You have to decide things that you do have control over. You know, all you can do is, is keep, keep moving on the things that you do have control over and then other stuff will happen as a result, but you don't know what, and you cannot have control over that. So giving up that control, giving up that sense of, you know, like this has to happen or I'm not the real thing is a huge weight off of most people's backs when they're Mm. trying to be creative people. So I do think it's really, it's really important when anybody is moving forward with a creative career to give it a real good thing. Do you want to have this be how you make money or not? I have a whole training I've done called three paths, um, that lays this all out that there's Mm. the one path, which is the one we know the most about, which is the least attractive to most people is low cost things. So services or products like at a very low price point or even a medium low price point where you have to sell a lot of them to make a living plus massive marketing muscle, like most of your time, 80, 90% of your time on marketing. That's one path. And that's what we hear about with the, you know, web celeb uh, marketing people who, you know, talk all the time about how can you show up on, on Instagram constantly? That's what they're trying to promote is that path. And that's what most artists and creatives start doing. And even people who are in your audience who are commercial creatives, they'll price their services way too low, Mm -hmm. you know, and they'll end up in that same position where they feel like they have to have a massive audience. They're constantly marketing and all that stuff. And it's, it's, you know, for most people, some people thrive that way, but for most people, it's not really a functional way to live. The second path is what we talked about initially, which is having a higher price point service offer of some kind, or potentially, you know, you have a high cost product, like you are an artist who actually can sell at a very high level, very rare, but it happens, right? Mm -hmm. Um, That's also a possibility. So that's a path. Um, But in terms of what you have a lot of control over, it's usually a service-based offer. And then the third path is don't do it. You know, either (laughs) move to someplace that's cheaper you know, sell your car, ride your bike, you know, buy only like bulk foods, you know, lower your cost of living enough that it doesn't cost much to, to live your life and live off of, you know, what you make and, you know, selling your work or get a job, you know, start a business, do something else where you are, you're not trying to make your work bear the economic weight of your life. Those are all legit choices, all totally fine choices. And they're trade-offs. They're dilemmas. You know, it's a dilemma of like, which way are you going to go? But everybody gets to make that choice. Most people don't make it consciously. They just end up someplace. Mm. So that seems like a good segue to the baby step question. So do you have a baby step that listeners can take? Boy, I could think of a lot of baby steps depending on what they're, (laughs) what they're thinking about. Like what, what question does this bring up? Uh, well, I mean, even what you just said maybe yeah. is the baby step, right? Yeah. If if you haven't consciously decided with Pat which path you're on, maybe the baby step is let me think about which path am I actually on, and is it the one I want? Yeah, that's not a baby step, though. That's like, <laughs> a, I mean, it's it's a baby step in the sense that all you need to do is sit on the sofa and think. <laughs> but maybe a glass um, of wine. Yeah, maybe several glasses of wine. But the, um, <laughs> it is such a big decision, mm. and it's so fraught. Um, Mm -hmm. but I think knowing that the choice is there to be made. And I think that for people in your audience, it's very likely that they're thinking path one or path two. They're not thinking about opting out, although maybe they should consider it Mm -hmm. if it's just not tenable for them. But, um, looking at path one and path two, are they trying to sell low cost products and sort of killing themselves or low cost offers and killing themselves to do it by trying to, you know, slog through massive amounts of marketing? Should they figure out how to repackage their products or services so that they can charge more, have fewer clients and do less of that? You know, that's Mm -hmm. a decision that is within like all under the umbrella of having your own business, having your own service-based business, having your own commercial creative business. I think that's a question not enough people ask of themselves. That's what's at stake when you, that's why people say raise your prices. That, that is why it's, it's, you hear it all the time. Nobody explains why, except like, you'll make mm-hmm. more money. No, <laughs> it's mm-hmm. not that you'll make more money. It's that you can have fewer clients, which means you can do less marketing, which means you'll have more time and more space in your life. 
for the work that you want to be doing and to be doing excellent work. So that's why. But so that choice, I think, is absolutely worth every independent worker p- contemplating. Um, but then that third path, it's like if you're miserable with what you're doing and neither of those things sounds good to you, I mean, maybe it's time to think about like, does that, is that an option? Because Mm -hmm. then you get to do, that doesn't mean stop doing your work. It means do it your way and don't try to make it into, you know, a job. Interesting. All right. Well, thank you, Jessica, so much. I've learned a lot. (laughs) Thanks. This was really interesting. Great conversation. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, yeah, maybe we'll have a part two. That would be great. I'd be more than willing. And tell people where they can find you online. Uh, you can find me at my website, jessicaable.com. You can also find me on LinkedIn. I'd be happy to hear from anybody who's a listener of yours. Excellent. Thank you, Jessica. It's really so interesting how we can each approach from such a different angle and attract the people who we can help. Jessica's baby step is to identify which path you're on. It takes some thinking, but it's a really important choice to make consciously. So if you want to build a thriving business on your own terms, the first step is to sign up for my quick tips at marketing-mentortips.com. Once you're on the site, you'll find lots more resources, including my simplest marketing plan. So enjoy, and I'll see you next time.